Okay, so well, we start out on session with a talk by Professor Pistol. On uh, he'll talk us about isospectral graphs. Okay, please. Okay, thank you. I would like to start by thanking Professor Bileshev also for arranging this conference so I can present my results. Спасибо вам, я очень рад. My Russian is a bit too bad, so I continue in English. So I just talk about isospectral, but not isomorphic quantum graphs, also using different boundary conditions. So this can be seen as an inverse problem. So I'll start by some introduction to quantum graphs that are a bit different from different other types of manifolds. How to compute eigenvalues and how to find isospectral graphs. And this has been done to a large extent by computer. How to generate isospectral graphs combinatorically. There's a way to do that. <clears throat> and also isospectral pairs that are not obtained in this way and some future outlook and closing remarks about these things. So I'm working on weighted graphs. And this is one example. So we have a standard graphs, in the, my guess, most often equilateral. So each edge has length of one. It, that's not necessary though. And it's a compact graph, meaning that there's a finite set of, the length of each edge is finite and there's a finite number of of edges and the graphs are always connected so they don't depend on two, two different graphs. In each edge we define the Laplace operator and then the solutions on each edge are given by this. This expression. On top of that we need boundary conditions. And the most common boundary conditions are called neumann kirchhoff boundary conditions. That means that the function at each vertex or continuous and the sum of the outward derivatives at that vertex is a constant times the value of the function at the vertex. Very often alpha is zero, in which case we have the Neumann boundary condition. This is not necessary. <clears throat> I call these boundary conditions delta alpha. If we have do this, we get an eigenvalue problem that system is self-adjoint and we can find real eigenvalues that go to infinity and start at zero. I also use other types of boundary conditions making the system self-adjoint. There's a prime type where the outward derivatives or the functions are the same at each vertex and the sum of the function values is a constant times the value of the outward derivatives at the boundary conditions at the boundaries with beta is the free real parameters delta is prime of beta and there's also some delta prime gamma boundary conditions of this type you don't have to memorize this this is actually a fourth set of boundary conditions as well which treats each edge in the same way. So it's symmetrical with respect to each edge. At the what, what is F0? What, what, what is right. it? It's the value, it's the function value at the vertex. That is just a number. Uh -huh. So at, at a given vertex, and these are the edges of the of the the values at the edges at this vertex. The output derivatives have some value, the same for each edge, and that I call delta and F0. So this is sort of just ah, okay. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I put it the same here. So if I take the sum of the values or the function values, it's beta times this delta and F0. So this these types of boundary conditions have been investigated by Pavel Exner and other co-workers since a long time. They were also interesting. Most of the time I use Dirichlet. Uh, no, I have to come on the next one. At the boundary, at the pendant edges, we can have either Neumann or Dirichlet boundary conditions. 
So either the derivative of the function is zero or the value of the function is zero at, at the pen at edge at the edges that end in nothing. I use both. In order to solve this, there is a certain secular determinant, sigma k, such that for k equals kn, this value is zero, and then we have the eigenvalues given as the squares of these eigenfrequencies. And that's a linear equation system, and it's a bit tricky maybe sometimes to obtain it, but it's been described in many places, like in the thesis by Marlena Novacek at Lund University, by Grisha Berkulaiko in this PDF, and by Gutkin and Smilansky as well. So it's a well-known way to obtain the secular determinant. It's not unique either. There's a prefactor you can choose, which numerically is better in many cases. I use several variations variants of this secular equation, but they're all equivalent that the, the roots are the same for all different secular determinants. So enter a computer. So I wrote two different computer programs that if you give it a graph, it computes the secular determinant exactly using Neumann boundary conditions. And these are two different computer programs. And I did that in order to make sure that the software is correct. If the lengths of the edges are rational dependent, I can find all solutions of sigma of k equals zero that I find all roots, that is all eigenvalues exactly or symbolically in some sense, sometimes I have to solve uh, polynomial equations of high degree, and then that is by necessity, I need to use numerics. This I tested against all known results in literature to make sure there's no bugs in the program. And then I wrote a third program where I used different boundary conditions. These are just Neumann Kirchhoff boundary conditions. In the third program, I can also use Dirichlet and Delta Pi boundary conditions because I'm it's interesting for me to have used different boundary conditions. Excuse me, uh, what does it mean to test known results? What was the subject of testing? Is to make sure that my computer program is correct. <clears throat> uh, I, I mean, you, so I, you claim that you have tested known results, right? What tested, does it mean? What, what, no, what, no, I took results from the literature for known secular determinants, like for star you graphs. Mean, you mean uh, examples of isospectral graphs? No, no, graphs in general, to make sure that I can compute the secular determinant correctly. Ah, uh -huh. That is my main word to make sure the program is correct. If the oh, okay. program is incorrect, mm -hmm. everything is just thrown away. Mm -hmm. That's why I wrote two programs also to make sure that, and they do agree to each other with at least 1,000 graphs that I've given it to it. So uh, the probability of my programs being correct is, I would say, quite high. And in many cases, people have asked me from my email about things and essentially said my results are wrong. And in every case, my computer has been correct and people sending emails have been wrong. Even convinces myself that it's very surprising results. This cannot be right. Checking, checking, turns out I've been wrong, the computer's been right. Okay, the main problem is <clears throat> what's interesting for me and many other people is we have two different graphs. These are two examples, and these are, I think, maybe the first paragraphs that have the same eigenvalues, the same spectrum, the same secular determinant despite not being isomorphic in the sense that the length A and B, you can choose the values as you want. So this is the two parameter family of graphs that are isospectral. I also tested these two graphs against my program and my program shows that these two graphs are indeed fully isospectral. So good class Melansky who found this to this pair did it correctly. And this has then been continued by other people like Ban Shapir and Spelansky to find more isospectral pairs, in particular trees. And they do this by hand on different types of constructions, Sunara construction, I think. 
but I decided to do it by computer instead. So I took all graphs having different type number of vertices, equilateral graphs. That means the length of each edge is one. Otherwise it becomes computationally not feasible. This is the number of graphs having 11 vertices. It's um, 101 million graphs, slightly more. Six vertices, we have 112 graphs. That's the first case where you find one set of isospectral pairs. If you go to seven vertices, there are five pairs that are isospectral, nothing else. At eight vertices, we have 39 pairs, one triplet, three triplets that are isospectral. Not a single tree and not a single set of four. First at nine vertices, we get the first set of four isospectral graphs and the first set of trees that are isospectral. Then I couldn't continue because the computer limitations made it impossible for me to go through all these combinations. So I just created a subset of graphs being trees alone. And then I found two pairs with 10 vertices, five, six, and 37 pairs of trees with at most 13 vertices, with exactly 13 vertices. And then this also stopped because my computer, uh, I'm limited by computing speed. And now I give some examples of the first isospectral pairs. So this pair have six vertices and these are isospectral. This is, and that's the single one example of pairs with six vertices. There's, there are no more. Seven vertices, we have this example, the, this pair as well, this pair, and this pair, and this pair. So all the rest of them have seven vertices, and that's all of them with seven vertices that are isospectral. I still use Neumann boundary conditions, the absolute most common boundary conditions, Neumann Kirchhoff and Neumann also at dependent edge. So this was done systematically. I went through all possible graphs, having six, seven, eight, and so on, vertices. And then I found, much to my surprise, that the most, one of the absolute simplest graphs, that is the loop, has two isospectral partners. So these two graphs have the same spectrum as the loop. And this has been checked by other people also now. For instance, Pablo Kuras, so if you checked it on the whiteboard in Stockholm. And after half an hour of decomposing this into symmetric subgraphs, convinced himself that they do indeed have the same spectrum. And the same is true with this one. The interval itself cannot have any isospectral partners because it's the, that has been proven by Serge Niquez that is unique. Excuse me. Uh, yeah. So, so, two graphs as the first line. The left, left one is just a loop, and uh, the right hand, uh, right graph is a loop with uh, two edges, right? And right. you claim, you claim that these two graphs have the same spectrum yeah the same uh, you mean uh, uh, with the multi uh, taking in that into account uh, the multiplicity of uh, eigenvalues also including the multiplicity yes it's correct and the same with the third graph and see that's fantastic so <laughs> Very impressive result. It is, uh, but first, but first impression, uh, it is very, extremely strange. <laughs> Nevertheless, uh, if if it's so, uh, yeah. okay. Thank you. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Hello. This you can ask questions as much as you want, unless the chairman thinks otherwise. And these graphs also, it's possible to check by hand that the um, graphs are isospectral. The hard part is to find them. To then compute by hand is 
it takes, if you're used to it, maybe five minutes. And I've checked these graphs by hand and shown for myself also, they are indeed isospectral. The sectoral determinant is absolutely the same. So please check. I like to check. If you find errors, please tell me immediately because I would hate to have problems in my program. And it's also interesting that every quantum graph master student has calculated the spectrum of a loop with an attached pendant edge, a tadpole graph. But apparently nobody has done it with two pendant edges because then they would have found this isospectrality. Okay. And you mean that uh, you mean that the determinant sigma, which you calculate for every for every graph, is the same for the loop and for the uh, right graph, right hand side graph? Yes. 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 Exactly the same. Uh huh. And also okay. both. Thank you. Very, very unexpected results. Uh huh. I'm sorry. Yeah. How do you determine uh, multiplicity? I check if the secular determinant is the same for both graphs, but I can also solve the is secular it polynomial. Hmm? It, it, is it a polynomial? The secular determinant polynomial yes. in key? Yes, but it's a bit complicated because it involves cosine and sine and so on. But it, we're exponential functions of complex arguments. But indeed, it is a polynomial. And is it true that uh, multiplicity of a root of this polynomial is the same as the multiplicity of an eigenvalue? Yes. Always. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But these two graphs, these three graphs, have the same secular determinant. So it doesn't matter. I mean, the multiplicity must be the same. I mean, you get that from the. Oh, okay. I understand the question. Yeah, it's the same. Thanks. There is some questions about. The first algebraic, type, algebraic, algebraic and geometric multiplicity might be different if you have a graph connected two different components of a graph that are disjoint for the union of two different graphs. That one has to be a bit powerful. But I don't consider that case yet. Maybe I'll do it later, but so far I have graphs that are all connected, fully connected. And then I did the same thing, but with different boundary conditions. In this case, Neumann Kirchhoff boundary conditions at these, let's say, internal vertices, and the Richelieu boundary conditions at pendant edges, that is, edges that end like this one, or this one, pendant edges. And these are the first six isospectral pairs. I found in this case. And they look a bit different, maybe. Though I have some colored vertices here also. I'm going to explain soon what that means. It's They are quite interesting. But the, the number, uh, could you please show previous? Uh, the pair A, the first pair, the number of pendant vertices is different. No, it's two. Or ah, the... yes, yes, yes. I'm sorry, but uh, but uh, as the next as the next case B, uh, uh, the number of pendant vertices are different. No, this is also pendant what? vertex edge. This one, it's a bit hard to see. It is not a pendant. Yeah, it is. It does not, these two vertices are not connected. It is pendant. Uh, you mean uh, uh, due to zero Dirichlet data at one of the vertices? Or... Yeah, it's not even connected. It's a bit difficult to see, maybe. Uh -huh, uh -huh. You see now, right? Ah, I see. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hey, it's a problem to draw these things. I'm sorry. I mean, this is not the only problem. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. The same is true in this red one here. It stops in the middle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For these graphs, it seems that the number of pendant edges must be the same. At least that's the case so far. 
but of course not the case with Neumann boundary conditions at Pan edges. Then I continued, I found some very, very interesting isospectrographs. These graphs, these pairs are isospectral. There are Neumann boundary conditions at these pendant edges, but they had delta type boundary conditions at the other edges. That means there is in fact a parameter here, alpha, that can be chosen at will. And they still remain isospectral. So these are very, very isospectral pairs. It's a whole family of isospectral pairs or under a whole family of boundary conditions at these internal edges. In the beginning, I spoke about boundary conditions. It's a bit, of course, difficult to remember them, but there is a parameter here, alpha, that you can choose at will, and they remain isospectral. So these are much more isospectral than standard. Excuse me, Eric, at the, at the pair A, number number A, yeah. uh, what, what what is the reason to select red points? What does it mean? I, I will come back to that, but for those who know, that those vertices have the same M function. Uh -huh. Dirichlet okay. to Neumann map, but I, I'll return to that soon. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Those are very important, actually. Uh -huh. I continue though. These graphs or isospectral pairs under delta type boundary conditions internally, or delta S prime type boundary conditions also. So the two types, two families of boundary conditions that you can apply to all internal edges and they remain isospectral. So these are very, very isospectral graphs. But it doesn't end here. These two graphs are isospectral on the delta alpha type of boundary conditions and the delta S prime or beta or delta prime of gamma boundary conditions, where alpha, beta, and gamma are parameters that can be chosen at will. No matter how this is, these are chosen, these two graphs remain isospectral. So these are- And once again, uh, Eric, excuse me. Yeah? Uh, once again, uh, for each of them, you find in explicit form, the polynomial, uh, the yes. determinant. Yes. And the I'm... determinant is the same. It's exactly the same. Fantastic. Okay, very uh, interesting. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, the, and that's important because I don't do any numerics because doing numerics, things might become precision, depend on the precision, but not here. This is symbolic all the way. So I am, that's much better than having to compute numerically the roots or polynomials or stuff like that where it's always some problem. I, that, I tried that in the beginning for half a year and don't do that. It's a problem. And what is typical degree of this polynomial, for, for instance, for this case? Oh, I will show. I you will show. Uh, excuse me. Uh -huh. if, if, I, if I get enough time, I will show that by because I can uh -huh. demonstrate the computer program of it. And then I went to trees, and these are the first three isospectral trees. There is one with nine vertices and two with 10 vertices, Neumann boundary condition. Okay. Uh -huh. Interesting, maybe. And with Dirichlet boundary condition at pendant edges, these are the first three sets of isospectral graphs. It's one pair a triplet very quickly and a pair again. And the actress of Pivovarczyk computed this and found the same sets of isospectral graphs by hand. And since he found it by hand and I found them by computer, it makes it also quite likely that my program is correct because it's exact agreement with, let's say, <clears throat> Uh, hand calculation of proofs if a hand calculation is said to be a proof. But so this was a encouraging. Excuse me, every time it, uh, the edges it, in every case the edges are commensurable, right? 
commensurable. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, no, the edge length is one, all is one. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I don't have to, I don't need to have them to one, but I sure, sure. This. If Computer. they are not commensurable, uh, to, to calculate the corresponding polynomial <laughs> is impossible, maybe. Uh -huh. It's at least impossible to get solutions, that's for sure, but. Uh -huh. There are, I can most likely find the secular determinant in those cases also. Yeah. But I also found these two pairs. You can have either Neumann or Dirichlet boundary conditions at the pendant edges. They are still large spectral. And at internal boundary, Vertices. You can have even delta type boundary conditions or delta S prime type boundary conditions also. And they're still isospectral. So these graphs are incredibly isospectral. Since you can choose boundary conditions not freely, but to a large extent as you want, and they remain isospectral. So there's something deep in these graphs that make them isospectral. But there are exceptions. These two graphs are isospectral under Dirichlet boundary conditions at the edges and delta type boundary conditions at vertices degree three, this one and this one, this one, this one, and this one is Neumann. But if we change the Neumann boundary conditions at all vertices, then this graph has this graph as an isospectral partner. But if we have Dirichlet delta 3 alpha, it has this graph as the isospectral partner. And here we have another set of four graphs where the isospectral partner depends on the boundary condition, which is shows that many other things can happen here. So this mm -hmm. will be a bit difficult to find general results. I also wrote the program to be able to visualize the eigenfunctions. So here we have eigenfunctions for this tree graph using different types of boundary conditions. The Dirichlet, Neumann-Kirchhoff at internal edges, Neumann at pendant edges and Dirichlet uh, non acute internal edges, and here is one with continuity of the first derivatives, I think, at the internal edge. And that is very good for getting some intuition concerning this, these graphs, and to help to maybe find new theorems. I have so far found nothing new, but I disproved some guesses I had. Okay, my colored vertices. There's something called a Titchmarsh whale M function or Dirichlet Neumann map. It maps the value of a function to its sum of outward derivatives at the compact vertex, or you can also have it as a set of compact vertices. I use only one vertex. That's described in the book by Berkulak and Kushmal, Alkura Samuller in the in a paper on the archive, and also in a book, I guess in the book by Kurasa also. The key thing is two vertices in one graph have the same n function. One can attach a graph to one of them, either one of them, I get isospectral graph, graphs. I found a way to compute if two vertices have the same n function, that can be done quickly also. I don't, I can even get the n function numerically, but not algebraically. But I can at least determine if they have the same n function. So if we have, if these two vertices have the same n function, we can attach a graph, two different vertices of the same graph to this graph in two different ways. So you mirror this, we flip it. And then these two graphs, resulting graphs or isospectral. Or we can have two graphs attached, one to this vertex, one to this vertex. And this can be done in two different ways. 
and the graphs are isospectral. And then you can mirror the whole thing so you can sort of visualize it differently. Excuse me. Uh, the points are marked at which uh, the veil functions are the same. Yeah. No, the M function uh, is the same, yeah, at these places. For this graph uh -huh. and this one. For most vertices, the M functions are not the same. But if they do have vertices for the same M function, that gives a lot of possibilities. And the graphs you attach here, they can have any self-adjoint boundary conditions. They can be very complicated. In fact, you can have also freedom of choosing boundary conditions when you attach. Not complete freedom, but some freedom also. And you still get isospectral graphs. And then I found this pair of graphs, this one and this one. But these two vertices, they have the same M function. And you can change the boundary conditions inside this graph as well, from being delta alpha for some alpha, or delta prime S beta for some beta. The same on both graphs. And they remain, these two vertices have the same M function. But rather, I mean, you do that on this graph, and you do not change that the two vertices have the same M function within this large set of boundary conditions. And then you can attach in two different ways and get uh, isospectral graphs. So it gives a very, very large set of graphs, isospectral pairs of graphs, independently of quite big families of boundary conditions. And then I found this remarkable set of four isospectral graphs, which have 21 sets of vertices with the same M function. Each set has a different M function, but the vertices within each set have the same M function. And these are two examples. The green vertices have the same M function. The red vertices have the same M function. That's the only two graphs, uh, vertices that belong to all four graphs. So this is allows the construction of fantastic isospectral graphs. Some other possibly interesting pairs of isospectral graphs. This black star means there's no connection here. They don't have a common vertex. Otherwise, they do have a common vertex. Some other pairs which are Possibly interesting. The last one is a triplet. This has been confirmed by other people now to be isospectral. These things are isospectral pairs. These are isospectral triplets. Green vertices have the same M function. Red vertices have the same M functions. And the same for this triplet. And these triplets are quite similar. They do not generalize. Oh, Eric, excuse me, very exciting picture. Uh, at, the, at, at the second case, uh, B, in the case B, in the case B, all of these graphs have the same spectrum. Yeah. And at the pending, uh, at, at, at the pendant vertices, uh, there are uh, equal M functions. Is it correct? Yes. It means that uh, having M functions, one cannot recover the structure of the graph uh, if uh, the M functions are given only on pendant vertices. Is it correct? I would say that's the same. That probably applies to some work by Billy your work uh, to reconstruct things from the boundary conditions, yes, from the boundary. I haven't done much work on that, but I will read your work later to get more insight into this. These are isospectrographs. I have hundreds of examples in my GitHub repository. Okay, back to testing. My programs are open source and are available on GitHub under this address. 
the manuscript is on the archive, it's updated, and now at version 15. In the GitHub, you have notebooks, you can recreate all my results and more. It's good if people can test these things. And I, if somebody wants secular determinants, send me a graph, I'll send back the secular determinant to those who want. What is a proof? People sometimes doubt computer proofs. I mean, computer programs have errors, but so are proofs. And you can also check computer programs. Some people think that having machine computation is more reliable than hand calculations, like this famous paper in the theory of stable homotopy groups of spheres, which is a very complicated area of mathematics. Peter Schultz uh -huh. wanted a computer proof uh -huh. because he wasn't sure about his own results. I found papers when my program does not agree with the theorems in the paper. So somebody is wrong. And computer assisted mathematics is getting a pension, and the future of mathematics will be computerized. So I would now like to share, but so you can check, look at my computer program. Is that okay, Chairman? Okay, I'll demonstrate my computer program. Okay, so so what's now? We have five minutes left. Uh, no, I, I'll demonstrate the computer program. Yeah, yeah, I, I understand, yes. Just, just remind May I ask a question? Uh, excuse me. May I ask a question? Yes. Uh, about the sentence, somebody is wrong. Yeah. Did you discuss the no. problem with? No, it could be a maybe a type of this. There is a problem in the paper, yeah, that's for sure. Or in my program. They are claiming that two pairs of graphs are isospectral. I don't, I don't get them to be isospectral. Uh -huh. Nobody at, this, nobody at this conference. Could, could you show also the previous slide? The previous slide? No, no, no. Previous slide. This one, yes. I'm shocked by the second example. So it means that M function M function of the global graph, a global M function, which means that you have M functions for each pendant vertices. Nevertheless, ah, wait a little. There are different number of pending of Precisely. pendant. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I see. That, that, uh, that may be uh, so that's so from the viewpoint of the inverse problem, these cases are not comparable. Are not comparable. That could be the case. Yeah. But did you try? Did you try to? There is, uh, as far as I know, at the moment, there is uh, an open question. I mean that if you have a graph with pendant vertices, and uh, the, and uh, you use uh, in capacity of inverse data, you use. Uh, the global M function, it, it means that for each pendant vertex, the vertex you, you have, uh, you have uh, M function. And the question, uh, very, uh, very interesting and uh, exciting question is whether uh, this um, global M function determine, determines the graph. And uh, your uh, examples, can your examples clarify the situation in this uh, question? I will think about it. And thanks for raising the question. You should, sure. It is very interesting. And yeah. uh, I think that uh, Pavel Kurasov uh, is also, <laughs> he should be very, very much interested in uh, this kind of activity. Eric, it's very interesting, yeah. really. Mm -hmm. 
You know, the problem, I have a problem to compute the M functions. I can compute if they're equal, but I don't know the shape of them yet, but I'll see if I can mm -hmm. fix that. Might be a bit problematic. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so Misha, can, can I ask for the run of time? Yes, William. Yeah, yeah, we have maybe one or two minutes for questions. Yeah, okay, uh, can I ask you? Uh... Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't. I don't see the speaker. Me? I, are you here? I'm here. Yeah, okay. Uh, could you please um, uh, answer me? Uh, how do you define M function? It's the derivative. The, yes, the do, you, do, you, do you use boundary triples for that? No, I don't, I'm not sure. I... Mark, it's a special terminology. I think no, that, no. Uh, to, to know it uh, is not necessary in this kind of activity. No, no. For instance, uh, Kurasov, uh, maybe you know his works in quantum graphs. He systematically used boundary triples and the uh, while function, yeah, M function. Yeah. yeah, but I use very, very simple, only one vertex at a time. So it becomes not so difficult. It's just the ratio of the derivative and the function value. Что-то я, я не все понял, Миша. Может, ты понял? Oh, uh, I take the, <laughs> or the derivative of the function at dependent edge and divide it by the value of the function itself, unless the function is zero. Something With... like uh, when, you, when, you, when, you, when you, you, you should consider the problem, the entrance of Mij is when you set the condition at uh, i h equal to one and you measure and one other so zero and you measure on j h something like this so so i mean it's it's not indeed necessary i mean it's equivalent but it's not necessary uh, to use yeah. the okay. boundary triplets yeah okay. so you just defined by 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 some special solutions of uh, cache problem yeah the matrix also... elements of, of the whale whale matrix one more interesting point is that Eric, I think that you are able to uh, to calculate uh, by computer to calculate the so-called spectral data. It is uh, the derivative the derivative of eigenfunctions, Dirichlet eigenfunctions at the pendant uh, pendant vertices, and. Uh, uh, it is so-called spectral data. The, uh, it is also used as the inverse data in the problem of reconstruction of graph. Maybe it makes sense for you to calculate also spectral data. Yeah, I will see that. I think I can do it. Yeah. I'll at least test if I can do it exactly. Okay. So we, we will wait and hope. <laughs> For okay. your, your results. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, okay. So, any other questions? So, so I, I think we maybe do not have much time for.